aldol condensations using unknown aldehydes and ketones. If you are concurrently taking Chem 232, you have not yet covered the aldol reaction. As a result, this webcast will introduce you to the aldol reaction by discussing what it is and how it works. The aldol reaction is a valuable carbon-carbon bond forming reaction. As you know from Chem 232, making carbon-carbon bonds is incredibly important in organic synthesis. When an aldol reaction creates a new carbon-carbon bond, it connects an sp3 hybridized alpha carbon of a carbonyl, which is on our nucleophile, with a carbonyl carbon on an aldehyde or a ketone, that is on our electrophile. An aldol reaction can proceed through two mechanisms, either an acidic mechanism or a basic mechanism. As the name suggests, the mechanism you go through depends on whether you use acid or whether you use base. In this experiment, you'll be using a base, and so we will discuss the basic mechanism shortly. An aldol reaction becomes an aldol condensation, which is what you will be performing in this experiment, when water or a water equivalent is generated as a byproduct. On the previous slide, I told you that the nucleophile in an aldol reaction must contain an sp3 hybridized alpha carbon. Before we discuss why this is necessary, let us look at some structures and first define what an alpha carbon is, and then get some practice in identifying what alpha carbons fit this criteria. Here are four carbonyl structures. Let us look at the structure in the upper left. An alpha carbon is simply a carbon atom that is directly attached to a carbonyl. So this carbon here is an alpha carbon, and so is this carbon here on the other side. And if you go through the remaining structures, you can quickly label these as alpha carbons, because these are all directly attached to carbonyls. Notice how the structure in the upper right has only one alpha carbon. The right side of the carbonyl, being an aldehyde, contains only a hydrogen atom. Now let us identify which of these carbons are sp3 hybridized. Remember that an sp3 hybridized carbon is one that contains four sigma bonds. If we look at the structure in the upper left, this alpha carbon on the left side of the carbonyl here is not sp3 hybridized. In contrast, if you look at the carbon on the right, we see that there are these implicit hydrogens, remember? And so this carbon is in fact sp3 hybridized. And so, yes, this carbon can be used in an aldol reaction. You don't know how yet, but you will once we talk about the mechanism later in this webcast. If we continue on with these structures and label them with red X's, for alpha carbons that are not sp3 hybridized, and green check marks if they are, we see that some molecules, like the one in the upper left and bottom left, have two alpha carbons, but only one of those alpha carbons is sp3 hybridized. We see in the upper right that we have a molecule that contains no sp3 hybridized alpha carbons. We see a molecule in the bottom right that has two sp3 hybridized alpha carbons. What does this tell us? Well, this tells us that this aldehyde here in the upper right cannot be used as a nucleophile in an aldol reaction. It has no sp3 hybridized alpha carbons. These structures on the left, the upper left, and the bottom left have one sp3 hybridized alpha carbon. Therefore, these can be used as a nucleophile in an aldol reaction. Similarly, you see the structure in the bottom right, we have two sp3 hybridized alpha carbons. Therefore, this structure as well can be used as a nucleophile in an aldol reaction. Okay, so we can identify alpha carbons, and we can identify alpha carbons that are sp3 hybridized. What makes these particular carbons so important? What makes alpha carbons so important is their proximity to the carbonyl. Unlike most other CH bonds, the CH bond of an alpha carbon is particularly acidic. If we add a base of some kind, that base can deprotonate that proton, leading to what we call a carb anion. Now, in the past, when you've added a base to an organic molecule, you have never seen this type of reactivity. Why is this CH bond different from all of the other CH bonds you have seen in organic chemistry? What makes this bond different is the carb anion we form can be stabilized via resonance like so. 
to make what we call an enolate. Remember from general chemistry that carbon does not particularly like to have a negative charge because it is not particularly electronegative. This is why most of the time you cannot deprotonate a hydrogen atom attached to a carbon atom. However, in this particular instance, this negative charge is delocalized or spread out across multiple atoms via this resonance. And you can see that this resonance structure on the right, the negative charge has been moved from the carbon atom onto the much more electronegative oxygen atom. And this is much more favorable. So when you draw an aldol mechanism, while you can use this carb anion structure, traditionally you draw the enolate because the enolate is the more stable resonance structure of these two. Now, this process only works for sp3 hybridized carbons. If this was an sp2 hybridized carbon, say with an alkene, then you cannot deprotonate this hydrogen atom. Another common mistake I often see involving aldol reactions are students trying to deprotonate the proton on an aldehyde. Remember, the proton of an aldehyde is directly connected to the carbonyl. It is not connected to an alpha carbon. Take home message from this slide. An sp3 hybridized alpha carbon has a particularly acidic proton. This proton can be deprotonated via a base to form a carbanion. The carbanion can be stabilized via resonance to form this enolate structure. And it is this enolate structure that is traditionally drawn in an aldol reaction mechanism. Okay, now we know why sp3 hybridized alpha carbons are special. How can we use them in a chemical reaction? This leads us to the aldol reaction mechanism. Typically, you have a carbonyl compound with an sp3 hybridized alpha carbon, to which you add some base, as was shown on the previous slide, to form and enolate. Now on the previous slide, I showed this process in two steps. I first formed the carbon ion, and then I drew the resonance structure to draw the enolate. Usually, we don't do that, and instead we do what I'm showing you here. We directly form the enolate using the base in a single step. So here's our enolate, and this is going to act as our nucleophile. This nucleophile will attack our electrophile, which you know is some kind of carbonyl compound. Usually an aldehyde or a ketone. In this example, I shall use an aldehyde. What happens is our enolate, what we call collapses, to reform the carbonyl, and the electrons in our double bond act as our nucleophile to attack the carbonyl in our electrophile to form a new carbon-carbon bond, which I shall draw here in red. So these electrons in this red bond are the electrons that were in the double bond of our enolate. Now we're not quite done. We still have this charged oxygen, which we know is not particularly happy. So let's go ahead and use the proton we removed earlier to protonate that oxygen to form an alcohol. So not a particularly difficult mechanism. You start with a carbonyl compound with an sp3 hybridized alpha carbon and you use a base to deprotonate the alpha carbon to form an enolate. This enolate is our nucleophile and attacks an electrophile of some kind, usually the carbonyl of an aldehyde or a ketone. This forms a new carbon-carbon bond as shown here in red, as well as a negatively charged oxygen atom, which we protonate to form an alcohol product. And there we go, that is the aldol mechanism. In the lab, however, you will not be performing a generic aldol reaction. Instead, you will be performing an aldol condensation. And remember from the intro slide that a condensation forms water or water equivalent as a byproduct. Let's show how that works here. In the condensation portion of this mechanism, you will again 
deprotonate the alpha carbon to the carbonyl using a base. To again form an enolate. Now, there is no longer an electrophile for this enolate to attack. So what is this enolate going to do? What this enolate is going to do is collapse as normal, but instead of attacking an electrophile, it will push this alcohol off as a leaving group. So we have hydroxide, a water equivalent, leaving as a byproduct, and we have formed a brand new alkene in our product. And there we go. That is the condensation portion of an aldol condensation mechanism. Taking our aldol product, we once again deprotonate the alpha carbon to create our enolate, and this enolate collapses to push off our leaving group, the hydroxide, to form an alkene. Now let's talk about this mechanism a little bit. First, many of you may be thinking hydroxide is a terrible leaving group. How can hydroxide leave without being protonated to form water? There are two primary components to this. The first is we are in basic conditions. There's base around. There is no way to protonate this hydroxide to turn it into a good leaving group. Two, this final product we make on the right, this alkene, is what we call conjugated. Remember that conjugated means that we have double bonds adjacent to each other. So we have this CC double bond and this CO double bond next to each other. Conjugation is a thermodynamically stable arrangement. While it costs a great deal of energy to force this alcohol to leave as a hydroxide ion, we gain all of that back and more by forming this conjugated product. So what we call the driving force what allows this reaction to happen, even though it looks unfavorable, is getting lower in energy. It's the thermodynamic stability of this final conjugated product. Something else you may be wondering is, why is it necessary to go through the enolate to eliminate the alcohol? Why can't we simply deprotonate that hydrogen atom and eliminate the alcohol in an E2 mechanism? The reason the E2 mechanism is not applicable is because this direct concerted process has a very high energy barrier, whereas forming the enolate has a much lower energy barrier. And you know that the lower the energy barrier, which is the energy of the transition state, the faster that process is. So forming the enolate is a much faster process than doing the direct elimination. And that is why we go through the enolate when we eliminate the alcohol to form our product. This particular mechanism you see here for the elimination of the alcohol is what we call an E1CB mechanism. We call this an E1CB mechanism because it is an elimination where the rate determining step is unimolecular. As you can see here, we have only one species present in the elimination. And it goes through the conjugate base of the starting material where this enolate is the conjugate base of this ketone acid here. Take home message from this slide. The elimination of the alcohol to form the alkene condensation product proceeds through an E1CB mechanism, where a base deprotonates our alpha carbon once again to form our enolate, and that enolate forces off the alcohol as hydroxide ion to make our product. The alcohol is a terrible leaving group. The reason this reaction is able to proceed is, one, we're under basic conditions, so we cannot protonate the alcohol to make it a better leaving group, and two, the product we make is thermodynamically very stable. So the energy we pay to eliminate the alcohol is compensated for by the energy we get back from forming our conjugated product. Now that we understand how an aldol condensation works, let's talk about what you will be performing in the lab itself. In the lab itself, you will perform what we call a double aldol condensation using an unknown aldehyde and an unknown ketone. 
Remember earlier in this webcast when we identified how many sp3 hybridized alpha carbons were present in four example carbonyl structures? On that slide, we saw how the structure had two alpha carbons that fit that criteria. Therefore, each alpha carbon can perform an aldol reaction, and that is what will happen in this experiment. You will be given one of these four ketones, all four of which have two sp3 hybridized alpha carbons. And so each alpha carbon will undergo an aldol reaction. For your electrophiles, you'll be given one of three possible aldehydes shown here down below. You will be given one ketone and one aldehyde, but you will not be told which unknown is your ketone and which unknown is your aldehyde. The first thing you will need to do is using provided infrared spectra, you will identify which of your unknowns is the aldehyde and which of your unknowns is the ketone, which you will then have to justify in your lab notebook. So think about the structures I just showed you. How are the aldehydes different from the ketones? What stretches could you use to differentiate one from the other? Once you have made your identifications and checked with your TA, you will then add the correct volumes of each reagent to an Erlenmeyer flask. You will then start the reaction through the addition of a solution of sodium hydroxide in ethanol. For some unknown combinations, a precipitate will form near immediately. For other combinations, you may need to heat the reaction gently for the reaction to occur. Why would we need to add heat? Remember how in the condensation portion of the reaction, eliminating the alcohol is not a particularly easy process because the alcohol is a terrible leaving group. By adding heat, we provide enough energy for that process to occur. And finally, once your product has been made, you will collect it via a filtration. Once you have your product in hand, you will then perform a melting point analysis of your product and compare that melting point to the melting points of the possible products. In the lab handout, you will find a table of the melting points of the possible products. Within that table, you will select two or three products which are close to the melting point of your product. Make sure your product is dry before performing your analysis or your melting point will be incorrect. To narrow down the identity of your product from your selected choices, you will then perform an NMR analysis. You will be provided proton NMR and carbon-13 NMR spectra to interpret. By matching the NMR data to the structure of one of your choices, you can confirm the identity of your product. Be aware that you will likely see signals in your proton NMR spectrum that possess multiple J values, particularly in the alkene region. Once you have identified your product, you can then backtrack and identify your starting aldehyde and ketone. Ensure that you justify your conclusion for the identity of your unknowns in your lab notebook. To recap this webcast, the aldol reaction is a powerful method to form carbon-carbon bonds. The condensation variant of an aldol reaction produces water or water equivalent as a byproduct. The aldol reaction can be affected using an acid or a base. In this experiment, you'll be using a base. The base variant proceeds through an enolate intermediate that acts as your nucleophile. The enolate can only be formed from a compound that contains an sp3 hybridized carbon adjacent to a carbonyl. As the enolate is formed from deprotonating one of these alpha carbons, there has to be a hydrogen atom attached to the alpha carbon. And finally, the electrophile in an aldol reaction must be a carbonyl-containing compound, usually an aldehyde or a ketone.